Thanks everyone for joining us this morning. This is a really special exhibition, um, bringing Jane's work and Ross's work together for the, I think for the very first time, like actually exhibiting together, um, although they yeah. have worked closely together and are very prominent in one another's work always, um, seeing their work side by side is pretty special. Um, so we will, uh, Go ahead and jump in, do very brief introductions, because I think all, most everyone here knows Jane and Ross pretty well. Um, and then we will pin our, um, our camera person who's gonna give us a tour of the exhibition. So Deb's on camera and she'll walk us through the exhibition. Um, and I'll ask all of you to turn your cameras off here in a minute and it'll just be me, Jane, Ross, and Bill on camera um, doing a little conversation, sort of interview discussion um, as we walk through the show. And then we'll rejoin as a group and do question and answer and chit chat and catch up. So, um, Pops, do you want to introduce Jane since you have such a wonderful deep relationship? Sure. Um, well, um, gosh, what to say about Jane? She's a, probably the most wonderful. Or, well, I mean, I don't want to we'll go overboard here. Let's see. I first met Jane in uh, Seattle when uh, my dog Watson and the two of us, three of us met and Jane fell in love with Watson and she was a uh, artist in residence up at Tochop and was doing some work up there and we got to know her through Pilchuk. Um, she uh, subsequently, we've done a number of shows with her in Seattle. I've gone to visit her in uh, outside of Half Moon Bay in California where she has a, a very beautiful space there where her studio is and where she works. She also has workshops there at her studio there. Um, Sarah, why don't you go on and continue to, in more detail? Okay, I'm actually just uh, going to troubleshoot with Jane here for a second as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so I'll give you the sort of bio version of Jane's resume here. Um, Jane, Jane, as I think most of you know, is a world-renowned sculptor um, and, and artist um, working in an incredibly diverse range of uh, materials, um, but perhaps best known for her work in stone. Um, and then more, more recently, her work uniting stone and glass. And Ross has been really instrumental in um, the development specifically of the glass work. And Ross, I believe you and Jane first worked together when she did that artist residency up at Pilchuck that Bill mentioned. Um, Correct. And, and Ross really worked as Jane's gaffer. So in that role, um, helping realize her visions for these sculptural works in glass. Um, and, and also in that role, really helping her understand the possibilities of the medium. Um, so, and I think we'll see that really profoundly in this exhibition when you see their works next to each other, you can see how, how deeply they have influenced one another. Um, likewise, uh, you know, thinking now about Ross, Ross is a, is a master glass sculptor and has worked on teams um, like Dale Chihuly's, William Morris, um, Preston Singletary, and has been, um, is really one of the best um, sculpture artists in glass that I, I'm aware of um, and developing really a figurative style um, of sculpture in glass, which is pretty unique. Uh, and also, you know, thinking about some of the qualities of glass that we aren't so familiar with, like taking the shine away, thinking about these more subtle, transparent qualities, these, the way color and, and light play together in glass. Um, also, like Jane, you know, exploring a lot of gesture and these really subtle movements um, and and thinking a lot about the natural world and the relationship between humans in the natural world. So I think there's a really um, a symbiotic relationship between these two artists. Um, and I think we've got Jane back on. I think I see her. Hi, welcome back. You're muted. Let's 
see if they can get this. Yay. Thanks, you guys, you for. Go. Am I perfect. unmuted? You're unmuted. Here, so. Welcome back, Jane. <laughs> you missed us talking about you and introducing you, but <laughs> you can correct us on all the things we got wrong later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I think the one thing I wanted to say was well, I always usually say many. Um, Judy Beth, who is eyes closed, so he's, uh, he's not working now. Look. Turn again. Shit. It's frozen. <laughs> we can it's hear again. you guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you guys just look all frozen. I think mean, it looks like Ross is asleep. Um, like, hey Shannon, do you want to just try are turning we frozen the video? On your do you want to try just turning your video off and just having audio? That might help. Sure. And while we'll, they're doing that, while they're doing that, I'll talk. <laughs> Jane is uh, studio is located outside of Half Moon Bay, up on a hilltop, uh, overlooking the whole region. It's a spectacular studio and a spectacular spot, but obviously it doesn't have very good cell reception. If ever you have a chance to visit Jane's studio, it's a worthwhile trip up the mountain hillside to see it because it's just, uh, and you'll see why she's so inspired by these, the wildlife that she depicts. And, and one thing I can oh, clarify. Actually, I was pretty oh. inspired. <laughs> one thing I could clarify real quick is that uh, when Jane and I what first met, done? I actually wasn't her gaffer. Uh, I was a TA. Oh. And uh, the gaffers who were there at the time were glass blowers, not sculptors. And she was trying to have them make some things that they, glass, glass blowers technically don't, it's a different mindset. So when she was trying to have them make things, they, they really couldn't. Uh, and I saw her struggling with them. And I said, well, they're, they were doing, they were trying to do things that I knew I could do. So I, I had approached Jane and said, if you would like me to try, I have a, a slot coming up uh, as a, a TA, we were given a slot, a blow slot uh, to do a demo. So I asked Jane if she would like me to try to demo one of her pieces. And we worked it out and we did the demo and she got exactly what she was trying to have the gaffers make for her that they couldn't. So it just kind of, it was the luck of the draw, the right place at the right time. And just through the conversations that we were having that this relationship formed, again, I'd have to remember the date, but it was either 97 or 90, 98. I think maybe 98, 98. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. can now. Okay. So before that, um, Ross, Judy Pfaff brought Billy Morris to my studio on Green Street in New York. He said, oh, now I, I think we got knocked off again. No, nope, you're still so on. I just made the video of the work large. Okay, and so Billy, is, he, Billy makes glass. Well, he used to. Now he's, I don't know, shooting harpoons in Hawaii. But, um, and Ross was working with Billy at the time. And what Billy was explaining to me was that I would be interested in the alchemy of glass. And then until I met Ross, I didn't understand. And then Bill Traver basically had this idea that Judy and Billy and I, Will, William Morris, Billy and I should do a show at Traver Gallery called From Surface to Form. And <clears throat> Ross and I became really close, really fast because we, I would say, is there a way to do this? And he, he would say, not really. And I'd say, well, do you want to try? And he'd go, absolutely, you know? And we would invent this stuff that had never been done. It certainly wasn't Italian glass or whatever they call it. It was like 
you know, can we do this? And he'd say, yeah, but it's going to crawl. And I was like, can you make it crawl again? You know, and there was this level of invention and creativity and experimentation, which to me was the alchemy of making art. And it didn't matter if it was glass or stone or mud or, and we started working together. Um, and Ross and Kimberly Hall would come down for two weeks here, or we would go up to Pilchuck, which I have to say, I feel so grateful to Pilchuck for introducing me to another world and a level of intensity that likened to life in New York. Um, in, in, in such a profound way. And so we would start doing these glass workshops with each other and in just making stuff that had never been made in a way that we didn't even know if it was gonna work. I'd do drawings, Ross would do drawings. He'd show me all these chips. Kimberly would make these balls. I have tons of balls left of like K54 with 175 and a little 161 frit will give you <laughs> there'd be a ball and I'd say okay let's make a anyway that's the thing about glass I'm not a glass artist and I suspect in many ways Ross isn't either because I'd be like he went and saw a Klimt show and then everything had to be Klimt figuring out how Klimt thought of it you know and he doesn't have a horse he just saw a form that blew his mind and he's calling me up daily. Do you have pictures of these horses? What's the anatomy of the horse here? What colors would this be? What kind of horses have these horse names? And I, to me, that's what art is. It's an investigation of feeling and body through material. Hmm. And we have that in common. Don't you think, Rossi? Oh yeah, oh, absolutely. And it's it's interesting when I first started working with Jane, when she works with a material, it's sort of a, a, a removal process. She has a, a mass that she'll take parts away to make an object where when I work with glass, it can be blown. So it can be sort of long and flat and I can heat an area and blow it out. So we had this, we had to figure out this dialogue of I'll get to that. I just, I, there's a point that I have to work to to get to that point. So she, we, we had this interesting relationship because the materials that both of us worked with were completely different. But in the end, I was so observ observant of her, f I really had to look at her final forms to, to a degree how she got there. But because my process is not a process of elimination, but my process is subtractive and additive because if I can inflate something it gets bigger or, or larger which in a way really is bigger. additive so I would uh, either push from the inside push out the wings push out the chest so the forms were always sort of going through this metamorphosis that in the beginning there was this hard dialogue because she would ask me to do something and I would do it but then something would change later, later on that would affect what I did before. And we had to kind of figure out this dialogue that's really taken us 20 years. Uh, and it's been quite a, a, quite a, a journey to get to this point. Yeah. And I, I think this show in particular is really a culmination of that 20 years final. And this is actually something that Bill Morris, when, when I first, but the, the very first time I ever took glass, I, I met William Morris. And kind of in a joking manner, but kind of not, he says the first 20 years of your career, you make shit because glass is such a, 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 a unique material that to get to a mastery of it takes such a long period of time. And it took me 20 years to figure that out because I would, it is I such- Do I know how to interrupt? Oh yeah, You can interrupt. Ahead. Okay. So, but the one thing I want to say, not being a glass artist is that 
The truth of it is that it's always taken 20 years from the 1400s and before that. It takes so long when I look at, you know, any of my friends, Susan Walp or Judy Pfaff or Ursula von Riedensfart or Daniela Dooling or Celia Dr all all of us, the research that's involved with learning and discovery and, and you know, it, it's the same. And that's one of the things that I love so much. Like I just thought, I kind of thought, well, let's make a bird and the bird's just the maquette for the experimentation for crawling or layering or transparency or translucency or opacity. And that you then can translate that to, um, you know, stone. I mean, it's, but it's a learning thing. Like, and Ross said to me, cause I would say, can we do this? And he, he would look at me and he would, there were always two things. One was not now. <laughs> and the other was repeat, repeat, repeat. So, you know, I've learned so much from working with Ross about, you know, like, when we, you know, we work by, by video if we're working long distance and he's sending me pictures of the thing is turning and I, all I see is his sneakers and <laughs> hot glass. In the beginning, I was like, I really like this color orange, but that was just the color of heat on the glass. It wasn't gonna be orange, see? <clears throat> the, the thing is that I have learned a whole new way to think about what goes into the making of something. And I think you have too, Ross, right? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, so and, and one of the, the, I think most fascinating things to come out of this were some of Jane's drawings where she would do these preparatory, when, when she knew we would be getting together, she would do these studies of color and form and so we could discuss it and she would lay out these drawings and people would come into the studio and be like, that's the most amazing painting drawing I've ever seen. And Jane would just be like, well, it's like this, for example, it's just a sketch for, for, for me. So she would make these things for me yeah. that were, were absolutely incredible. So there is the notes, the different colors we would talk about. So she would draw this form and, and, and put these inks on and then write these little notes asking me, if about the, the turn of the head, what color we should use, if we should try this black or this black. And they're really, these, these are just sort of these little diary passages for, for Jane and I, but what they mean on a larger scope is, is I think very something very different than she had originally thought. Well, what's funny is they're doing this book on me, um, Pointed Leaf Press, and Susie, the publisher, and Michael were here yesterday and they just asked for all of my journals where I draw over and over again. And I start drawing a month or so in advance when I'm working with Ross. And I start laying out the drawings and figuring it out. Then I go to bigger drawings so I can photograph them and send them to him. And, um, and all they wanna do now is publish all these journal pages in this giant book. And I'm like, these are just, like studies for the deer. He's like, this is fabulous. I want to use this. I'm like, no, no, no. This is, I just, no, this is just a study, you know? And I mean, there's so much preparation that goes into us. Oh, look at that horse. That's very Etruscan, Ross. That's a beautiful horse. Shannon, look at this horse. <laughs> <laughs> The color on this one is is really really beautiful. You get this kind of rust color, um, and yeah, Ross. I mean, I think one of the things that you have really brought to this relationship is uh, is that ability to have that subtle application of color, and that really um, it's so it feels so unlike glass that I've seen elsewhere. Can you talk a little right. bit about how you're doing that? Yeah, actually, uh, I just had to give an interview recently and sort of sum up my history. And I pretty much, that's where I started. Uh, some of the early glass people I was looking at were, do, were using powders 
uh, I went to an art school and glass just sort of had no, it was more about having a fun time in, the, in a glass shop, never having the opportunity to ever possibly do it again. So I thought I would try glass. And uh, some people were in there that were using powders. So it, it looked, it didn't look like glass to me. And that's what I originally fell in love with and why I still do it to this day is that it, it, I fell in love with the aspects of, of it not being glass and the actual sculptural qualities of the way you can manipulate it. But Ross, so it's my, not glass, but it contains light. Right. That's a, that's a huge issue. It contains light. So it, it feeds you from inside out where most things are outside in. And, and a, a, a lot of these colors that I use or I, I would normally use were much more earth tone colors. Um, a lot of sort of brick reds, some grays, browns, but like this horse in particular, this is a, a color that is one of Jane's favorites, which is cinnamon. And I use cinnamon a lot in her birds. What's that? 175. Yep, yeah. So <laughs> this this is this is a horse made, and again, like I was saying, this this show really is sort of Jane's and really a lot mostly this is all Jane's influence on me so the work that, that these horses uh, where they come from is, is really working from Jane especially like the, the wall the wall horse um, or the the one that was on the wall right Love there that, one. that uh that was in response to, for, to doing the bird the wall birds for Jane that's burnt sienna though and a little bit of what a little K54 or the Phil's gray? Uh, no, it's probably different on the monitor, but it's it's more of a, actually, I don't think I use this color for you. It's a, a it's a darker brown. It's sort of like a chocolate brown, but then has oh, yeah, a Yeah, that's the one I don't like. <laughs> um, it has a, a latte, a creamier undertone. So there's a cream, yeah. a, a, a cream color underneath talk this about brown. That. Russ, talk about the, the aspect of layering when you've got that hot glass ball coming out of the punty and how you roll it with the frit first and or powder and then you do layer upon talk about that yeah so um like these birds for jane there's there's a, a what we use uh is called frit and it's sort of crushed up uh in different sizes so this what you see here on this chest that has that sort of feather pattern is one is, uh, is her favorite 161 um, hell beige, uh, which yeah. she loves to say. <laughs> and so there's a, a- I want it on my gravestone, <laughs> hell beige. Uh, we, I use hell beige in pretty much everything of Jane's, um, even just to have it on there so she can say she used it. Uh, but it's, it's um, I do different yeah. late. What's that? You can't see me, I'm just too oh. raven. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's a, a, a layering of, of uh, different colors and different patterns. So that is uh, certain layers on the top uh, come or the, the layers underneath come through the layers on top. It can create these different tonal values like on the tail right here, um, creating stripes that are on the very surface. And then there's that frit underneath that sort of has a feather like feel to it. Um, and with what I do on the horses where uh, I'll do a, a lighter undertone and then when I stretch out that nose, um, a lot of that undercolor comes through because when glass, when I, when I <laughs> stretch an area, I'll torch it. And sometimes the torching will remove some of that color on the surface. Um, so like on the eyes, the ears, uh, the nose and some areas of the neck, that color that's on the surface will burn away and stretch away uh, to re uh, reveal some of that under the color that I use underneath. And that's Jane and I uh, utilize that a lot in, in basically everything she does, where the, the chest is always the, the raw color that's underneath. And then I do different layers of colors on the surface, on the wings, the head and the tail. Uh, but it's all these different layers that give a lot of depth uh, to her work. I also, I also want to say that I'm not, I love birds but I'm not interested in making bird sculpture. The thing that interests me about the birds is that they're a manifestation of a certain posture or presence and that the way we're using the color and the inside to outside that can be 
can the gesture of something give rise to the inner life contained? And those forms, which I originally saw, I think from um, a melting um, Mary Magdalena, like people have these plaster Marys out on their lawn and they kind of like melt sort of like soap after a while, you know, animal soaps. And it seemed to me at what point could you take away the literal quality so that it's not realistic, but it contains the life of the thing and what color and what level of transparency would be necessary. And uh, Jane Hammond once said to me, um, she said, the problem with your work is like some of it's realistic, some of it's abstract, and I think there's a D, oh. And she said, so Jane, if like, if abstract is one and realistic is 10, are you a two, are you an eight, are you a six? You know, and I mean, that's the, that's the question I feel like we're asking more than what kind of a horse is this? It's like, what's this posture, this white horse's posture? Like it's a movement, like if you take, if you could see me, you would see if you took your hand, I remember I used to do this with you, Russ, mm -hmm. and roll your hand forward, you get the forward roll on, on a wave, right? And that's a more aggressive movement. And if you pull your hand back and you get the receding roll on a wave, you get a more passive movement, like a lamb. and. So all of these things represent movements or gestures or postures or states of being. And I just can't help but see it as spiritual. Yeah, and I can say uh, walking through the gallery and every day going into the gallery and being confronted with these pieces, they do each, each and every one, although they seem repetitive when you're seeing them like this, they're not repetitive at all. Each one has its own character and each one has a real presence to it. And that includes each of the horses, each of the birds, all the drawings, they all have individual characters about them. You really, you really feel that when you're in the space. And, and I had always considered myself a figurative artist. And a, along the way, uh, I've, I've used some animal imagery um, but people ask me about the horses a lot now because that's really what I'm making. But I, I don't, I, I, I'm learning, especially through Jane, about the horses, um, their proportions, their postures. But such as Jane was saying, she doesn't, she's not necessarily a bird artist. I'm not a horse artist. I use these to sort of create these humanistic emotions um, that we can all relate to somehow. We don't need to understand the proportion of a horse but you can sort of get a feeling much like these birds, you, you walk in and you're confronted with these beings that, that we relate to and, and this real visceral level that doesn't necessarily, you have to know what a bird looks like or a horse looks like, but the postures and, and the emotions that they emit. You can see here, right as in this picture right here, if you just stop for a minute, you can see the kind of presence that each of these pieces holds in that space. I mean, each one stands alone and is very clearly holding the space. And having all three in your home would be a lovely thing. <laughs> <laughs> Could live with it every day. Oh, but um, the, the thing that's important to know about the horses that I think is critical and why you're doing them now of all times is that in Persian art, the horse represents the intelligence of the emotions, the intelligence of the heart. And the horses, for me, horses always represent the intelligence of the heart. And they think with their heart, with their emotions. And the kind of like this stoic kind of looking forward. So if you think of it as what are <clears throat> our inner emotional life is. Each one represents, and, and if you want to see like that rearing horse, 
just watch a horse look at a plastic Safeway bag in the wind. <laughs> Man, that's something to see. But I have to add that Jane can speak to this really uh, clearly because uh, she actually what lived with two horses at her place there, her studio, uh, that right next to their studio. How long did you have those two horses there? At least 10 years. Actually, I still pay for Negrita, but she's twenty hours <laughs> assisted living at the vet house. But well, I, and that, that black horse that we were just looking at is in is fact Negrita. a portrait of Negrita. Yeah. Um, and she's still a bitch. I mean, <laughs> just really a, the most self-serving horse I've ever met. There's, but when I came from New York, I came for six months. I was going back and forth, but I came for six months and I moved to a horse ranch a hundred yards down the road and there were 60 horses. And I was known as the carrot lady because I'd go to Costco and I'd buy these 10 pound bags of carrots and go up and down the hills and I knew every single horse and I had no interest in riding them, but learning from them was so amazing. And I had this great friend. Hey Deborah, hold, hold that picture on that one just for a minute. Oh yeah, this is called Horse Drinking Water. Um, and I mean, it's from Portugal. I started it back then, but I, I feel like I mean, I hope my art contains some Jewish humor, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's like I see a horse drinking water. And Anne Hollingsworth, who's a wonderful um, kiln cast glass artist, would be making these pieces with me down here, solid crystal. And um, I think it's not a good material to work with. I, I, I'm hoping she's going to work with clay now, but that's a pe that base is Anne would make these bases and I wouldn't know what to do with them, you know? And then I didn't know what to do with that pink marble and it just stayed there forever. 20 years is a forever. And um, I think it's like, how far can you reduce it till you still get the feeling of the form? What is the essence? Um, the definition of essence is um, really the, um, what is it? it's the immortal versus the temporal you know, and abstract is not pertaining to a particular object or thing, as in honesty, whiteness, triangularity. And so that interests me is like, you know, Jane Hammond's thing of it's like, is it a six? Is it an eight? Is it a four? Where on that line can you still? And Ross and I would experiment with that year in and year out. How close can you get? to the object without making, you know, Bambi. Like, how, where's that moment where it represents the life of the thing without uh, the cartoon of it? I'm done. I, <laughs> I see that. Um, Deb, can you maybe turn around and look at the three drawings that are on the back wall? Because I see that in your drawings too, that same sort of exploration of like what is the how what is the gesture that on paper that creates the idea of this bird in flight you know what the color, yeah and it, it's so but they're so i mean they're they're eagles they're obviously eagles but then you look closely at what that is, the wash of color on the back, the simple line, the little tiny bit of white. And that's, you know, that's all it took to get there. Yeah, and but on the other hand, if you look at Ross's horses, he's giving you both the figuration and the abstraction simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And that's a good trick. I mean, that's a hard thing to do. 
and like how he cuts off the, I don't know how he does it. He's like making one part and then another part and then putting them together. And then he's cutting off with the cold working where the neck is. How do you know exactly where it's still going to represent the chest of a horse without looking like the chest of a horse? And that's what the drawings are for me as I start out with them, I have to start out realistically. And then as I understand the form, I can reduce it to the essence of the form. But the drawings for me are the studies or the observation of the actual thing until I understand it well enough to find its essential nature. You know, and that is the dream of my life. And hopefully, you know, how can, how can you do that? I still don't know. I feel like, I just hope I live to like 100. And there's this lady that lived 122. And um, I'm hoping I live that long so I could like, understand this a little better than I do now but I got really I don't know I got really lucky so far in life I'm done again <laughs> so what are you both working on right now what Ross what are you working on in the studio these days uh continuing with the horse trying uh just starting to try a new form a little taller uh longer and slender and trying to figure out if uh, they look good on the wall, on a pedestal, on a table, um, but just trying to figure out uh, a, a few new forms, much exactly like what Jane was saying, which is where a lot of my work is coming from or from Jane's teachings. Uh, what, how much information do I need to have and how much can I eliminate and sort of have that play of the breaking of the wave and the beak of a hawk to a muzzle of a lamb when figuring out where that form resonates because it's it's a lot of my work I try to wait for a resonation um, like she says uh, Jane was saying how I, I cut some of the form away um, I'll, I'll, I'll have an idea of where I want it to cut and I'll start there but then I stand back and look at it and if it's not right I'll rechange the shape I, I the way I cut some of these backs away to help sort of emphasize the other uh, curves and forms that are happening in the horse. So I'm not just cutting the back away, but I'm, I'm, I'm cutting and grinding to try to capture this sort of flowing movement as you uh, sort of work, uh, walk around the horse. Um, so it sort of has this uh, dancing effect. Uh, so just really playing with, with line and form, bends in the neck. Uh, the ears are the one thing I'm, I'm really kind of struggling with or have been struggling with to try to really capture a, a feel because uh, the, the ears can look uh, uh, aggressive if they're in the wrong position. And if the piece is sort of the soft flowing piece, if the ears are too aggressive, it changes the, the feel of the piece for me. So well, I'm just really trying to focus on that. They can't stand the ears going. They don't, they like the ears going forward. And um, Alex Curry has a horse where when it's happy, the ears go back. And when it's unhappy, the ears go forward. But the ears are there you know, language. Yeah. Because um, a lot of my figurative work, I would include hands and the hands, because when we talk, we use our hands. So I always saw, saw the hands as being this form of communication. And that's how I see the ears and the horses a lot of the time, too. Hey, Deborah, will you go over to the ravens on the two stone pedestals? I let, I'd love to have Jane talk a little bit about the overall aspect of this. Can you pull back a bit so you can see the whole thing and just stop for a minute, pull way back, so you, further back so you can see the, the whole of the piece. There you go. Now the, and the relationship of the two of them. Okay, hold it there for a minute. Jane, could you talk a little bit about those two pieces? <clears throat> I just got a whole view this time. Thank you. Shannon made me a whole view of everything. So I have these two ravens. Well, actually, I have more. It started with Mama Raven. And Mama Raven had a limp, and she was extraordinary. She was so beautiful. And 
I don't know anything about um, ravens, or I didn't, but then she had children. And apparently the female raven goes off if her husband dies and looks and goes to move to the new home where the husband lives. And this raven just wasn't doing well with men. I could really relate. She kept coming back and she'd have babies. And so one year she had Nutty and Chatty and then the Nutty and Chatty didn't leave. So every year there's between two and four ravens. The upstairs ravens, it's kind of like a masterpiece theater thing. It's like, uh, there's the upstairs ravens that live at my house and there's the downstairs ravens that live at the studio. And the downstairs ravens took up residence on these two big pieces of stone and they just had the most beautiful posture right outside my studio door and I wanted to make them. I just felt like they had oh, Hold on, hold on a second. Jane, hold a yeah. second. We missed part of that. So then probably the, the critical part of it is that these two ravens actually landed on these two stones. Yeah, they and there was live there. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, it's yes. breaking up a little bit. All right. Well, so they I'm gonna get closer to my thing here. Um they lived, they lived right outside my studio door and they hung out with me all day. And <clears throat> The posture that you see on these are, this was in order to learn, we had to, first we made a white one, Ross and I made, or Ross made a white one. We called it the albino clunky raven. And he really <laughs> was like a little top heavy. So he'd fall forward. And I mean, we worked on him for like, what, eight hours? <laughs> um, but there was an idiot who was working at the next, Never mind. And, um, Ross knows. And, and so, you know, it, it was like all these millions of drawings I did of these ravens and Ross was down here and hanging out with the ravens and he figured out the exact color, the exact balance, the exact light, and they had to live on the stones that they live on. Which, by the way, the ravens were very unhappy when we took away their stones. So now they live on the back deck and we give them um, almond biscottis. But um, those pieces, in a way, I think they're the masterpiece and the culmination, although we're, we're gonna get going again because now we're starting on other things. But Ross and I have been working for so long together and we understood each other's language so well making these ravens that these things came into being. And in all honesty, the ravens don't know they're not, that the sculptures aren't actually ravens. I mean, they're just so full of language and life. And I don't know if that's what you want me to say, but I was, I was so grateful to Ross and so happy with them. Aren't you happy with them, Ross? Yeah, I, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, they're the piece of a lifetime, really. I mean, it, there's some good shit about getting older. Um, it's like, you're not worried about whether you can do it or not. You just do it because, you know, it's time. I'm glad you can't see me because I'm squ quite animated here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to be a little bit I conscious of can... time. Um, and Jane, maybe we can get you back on video for the last 10 minutes here, see if it works. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and welcome everybody to come back into the room and let's jump in and just have a nice um, question and answer group conversation. Hi. <laughs> Hi, 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 Leslie. And if you want to see everybody, just go back into gallery view and we'll all be back there. 
Hi, Abby. Jane, could we say hi to the dogs? Yeah. Um, also, Jane, 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 right Jane, will you have them pick up yes. the, uh, Jane, pick up the uh, computer and just turn it around and just take a quick view of your studio. I'm not touching it. Yeah. <laughs> Look at the studio. Party. She's a wonderful young artist. And do you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And she's taking a walk with, and then she'll come around and. Rossi, that's the new Black Marble Raven. After 20 years, I should be out what to do with it. Sebastian. I don't know if you guys can see it there. Yeah, thank you, Shannon. Yeah, no problem. <clears throat> can we take a look at Pale Rider, Rose Shannon? On... Oh. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> afraid of the computer. Uh, uh, you can are, see it uh, there. It's not the best thank light. You. Yeah. Beautiful. Thanks for the tour, Shannon. Yeah, no problem. That just gives you a little taste of the studio. There's a lot more to it than that alone. The, the whole yard and her house, the whole place is amazing. Jane, how long have you been um, in Northern California now? It, it went off. My internet connection is unstable. Uh oh, we can hear you. Well, I just love that I'm unstable. <laughs> Great. Um, well, we have a reunion every well most years, um, which is why the show that I'm working on now is called Pause Pause because of the pandemic, but. Ross and Kimberly would come down or, and we would work here and we'd draw first and we'd look at pieces and hang out with the animals. And then we would go up to public glass and we would blow or carve or, you know, do something every day. And then we'd bring them back after they go into an annealer. I mean, it's a whole other world. It's a whole other language. and. Sebastian would come and make the lace and um, and I miss that. I'm really, I really want to work in the same space together again. I'm vaccinated. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, Daniela, are you vaccinated? I am good. I'm fully vaccinated. I yeah, yeah. Maybe I can come see you sometime, Jane. <laughs> Susie and Michael were here yesterday. Michael wants to do a print with you. Um, I yeah, I, I said that I know. before when I'm. Um, <laughs> I know. We'll talk about it later. Yeah, <laughs> no. I, this is your your thing. <laughs> I'm Ross's <laughs> thing. <laughs> <laughs> hi. Oh, I kind of like this. <laughs> it's pretty lovely to get to see everybody. Susan, where are you zooming in from? Are you talking to me? Mm -hmm. oh, I, I'm from Vermont. I'm in Vermont. I'm at home in Vermont. Hi, Jane. <laughs> hi, Susan. Oh, I showed so you cool. Susan's paintings. Remember the still life paintings, Sarah? Yeah, they're I absolutely remember. They're beautiful. Oh, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, I showed you Daniela's skull. I've, I show every, you know, I could have been a, a like a, a fight promoter in another yes. life, you know, <laughs> or an art dealer. Um, uh, <laughs> I just wanted to say, Jane, yes, I, I want, I was, um, anyway, it's so the whole 
conversation has been so wonderful and it's great to see the show and it's great to hear you talking about the work. And I was just thinking back to our early days of going to those um, drawing classes, the anatomy of class, classes with Robert Beverly Hale back in New York. And it, it was not a very cool thing to do back then. I mean, we almost did it in secret. We did and do it in secret. We used to sneak up there to 57th Street. <laughs> it was the height of minimalism and we were not minimal. These were like life drawing classes or? Uh, we studied anatomy. Um, With Robert Beverly Hale, just an, you know, an amazing, he was the curator of drawings for many years at the Met. Yeah. And he was just incredibly knowledgeable about human anatomy and um, drawing. And then Susan and I, who had really literally no money, would save up our money and we would hire a model. Oh, yeah, right. And, and uh, Susan lived on Green Street, we both lived on Green Street, and we would hire this model. And it was very important to us because it was a lot, <laughs> a lot of money. And we'd set up a, a site and you know, Susan draws very differently than I do, but we both loved each other's intention. I yeah. think. Um, and didn't we trade? Didn't we trade drawing? Didn't we like work on each other's drawings? That was just I think totally was, illuminating. Experience. It was very painful for you, I think, because yeah, it was. So Susan very <laughs> extraordinarily precise and has a very fine touch. And at the time I was an incredible mess and I was like rah, 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 rah. And <laughs> Susan would get this thing and she'd have to do something with it. And then years later when Susan visits me at the horse ranch, I made her draw with a hose. <laughs> <laughs> and and then there were also the years that um, Daniela was working with you. I have so many wonderful memories of Daniela. Hi, Daniela, in, in you know, the loft, in your loft at yeah. Green Street and, yeah. Daniela was wilder than me. It was like, we came back, we went to Portugal together and we came back. She, she was like on the forklift. She had a nine inch diamond blade. We wow. had some air fan thing that I, traded from the School of Visual Arts and we were carving all of these stones and she had no fear. Daniela, look at what I got in the book, the Coxcomb Oyster Shell. Okay. That's the one that you, and that's, Susie okay, said, I just want everyone. Take... Yeah, I just want everyone to know that you stole, stole that stole that from me. And <laughs> for, for those of you who don't know, know who I am and it's so great to, See you too, Susan. But um, I was uh, Jane's first assistant, um, and uh, she did not ever want to have a studio art assistant. Um, but uh, I somehow talked to her. She was my teacher at SVA, and I I said, "I want to be your apprentice. <laughs> I'll work for you for free." And then I got to Jane's house. And uh, she said um, to her loft, and she said, you know, I changed my mind. I don't want an assistant. And as things turned out, several years later, I was living with her and being her <laughs> full-time assistant. <laughs> um, and we're still friends to this day. <laughs> I that off. was a long time ago. Yeah, and then, and then she sent me, she was the professor at the time. Now she's a professor at Bard College and a wonderful artist. The time she was a professor at, Colgate and she sent me Celia Gerard. So it's like Celia's my granddaughter of art. Um, she was like, you gotta take this kid and do something with her. Do you remember that? Oh yeah. And I don't think we can yeah. hear each other anymore. We can hear you. We can yeah. hear you. Yeah, you can probably hear me without the computer. <laughs> <laughs> But Daniela, Daniela and I, I mean, that's the thing that's beautiful about a life is Daniela and I got, I got a grant, the Lusso American Foundation, 
to go to Portugal and work with their marble. And I think it developed my love of learning something that I had no idea about. And we stayed in the smallest hotel room you ever saw in your life. We would be friends until 190 because we survived that room and all we could eat were oranges and pig ears. Remember that? Oh, that was horrible. But, um, but I think that when Judy sent me to Pilchuck, um, Judy said, you have to go do this. And then I met Ross and it was like, you know, these, be these beautiful and magical journeys with others in, in honor of learning mm -hmm. and growing and stretching and doing something we don't know how to do and learning from each other and developing. I mean, that's, you know, that's as good as it gets, really. What a gift. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the big takeaways from me in doing this show and working with you and Ross on it is just, um, I mean, and I see it every day in the gallery, but really I feel it so strongly with you too, is the importance of the of relationship for artists and, um, and how much you are going on that journey together of learning and exploring and developing. Um, and it's, it's really been so, um, I think, poignant, like it, really from the heart to have the work um, in the same space in the gallery and to be able to live with it and, and experience that so closely. And for me, uh, this oh, is an example of a uh, piece of Jane Rosen's. This is a very early piece of glass work. It's uh, depicting my dog Watson, which uh, brought Jane and I what? into her gallery. Well, can we see the drawings of Allie? <laughs> This is Watson. <laughs> Pops, can you turn your computer around and show us the portrait of Allie Watson. too? I can't show you Allie. She's sleeping in the living room. No, the drawings of Allie. Oh, sure. <laughs> can you see them there? We were up there, Shannon and I. Yeah, that's Allie, Alabama. <laughs> It's hard to really see them, but I'm, I'm, you know, it's so funny because Susie's doing this book and she hates birds. Um, and so she's very strongly featured all of my dog art, <laughs> which is hilarious <laughs> because it's like, she, she loves the Mirandi piece. Or she wants that to be the cover of the book and she loves the vessels um, that Ross and I did, and um, which is very interesting, right, Ross? Because I kind of sh I kind of send him a picture of Mirandi's paintings, and he I think thinks I've lost my mind, <laughs> and you know I'm determined, and then he gets determined, and then we figure out these extraordinary glass vessels because I wanted them dusty. Mirandi never dusted his vessels that he painted. And so I wanted them to have that dusty feel. And then what happens is I send one of the beautiful ones that you made for me that was fluted, that's very Mirandi. And I send it to Susan as a gift and then Susan paints it. And so then I, and then I'm watching a Zoom thing on Susan and there's my Mirandi painting because I had to have that painting. You know, it's a work on paper, but it's a painting. Um, and it's like, I'm watching the West Wing and they say the way you change things is like, you know, just a few people at a time, a little bit at a time. I watch it every night. It's like, that's my, that's my company every in the evening. Um, but it's like, I've learned so much from working with all of you. I've learned so much. It's, it's so extreme. Look at, there's somebody like riding horses 
or something. I think that's Jackie, and she actually had a question for Ross, um, which she dropped into the chat here. And it's uh, Ross, have you gone to Literally. ropings or cow horse ranches to look at their horses for inspiration? No, I haven't. Uh, someone recently contacted me on Instagram. Um, they were trying to figure out because they did a lot of photography at uh, rodeos and some of these trick riding shows. Um, and they were asking if I wanted uh, specific references. And I just responded to them this morning saying, well, Jane sends me <laughs> reference material all the time. Um, but it's something, yeah, I, because that's such a different, uh, I know the horses that they use are different uh, for draft work, for, for rodeos, for trick riding, uh, different features, different aspects, different positions, different postures. Uh, uh, I've, I've been, from some of the, even some of the work here, the, the, a piece that's very upright is very different than a piece that's sort of more forward. And I know in, in a lot of the trick riding and, and sort of races where they are a much more forward facing uh, posture uh, just creates a whole different feel. So I, I, I haven't been, um, I have taught in Alberta. Uh, I was never in Alberta during the, uh, the big, um, they have a big rodeo thing up there. And I know Karen Willenbrink, I know Jane knows well, um, goes up there specifically for, she always made sure that her class was taught during the roundup, I think it's called. Um, but if you had a, Jackie, if you had a specific question. Um, yeah, it's, I was just wondering because your horses look very uh, English or a thoroughbred-esque, maybe like a combination between thoroughbred and like a uh, Arab. And I was just wondering if you've thought about doing the movement that are in quarter horses. Um, earlier you are talking about while you were um, talking about your horses and your work about continuing different like movements mm -hmm. and fluidity within it so i was just wondering if you were inspired by different breeds or even different um ways of working horses ross uh, cash was a buttermilk palomino quarter horse he was a cow horse so that's the difference between him and negrita but he died of old age and so I, you should. I most, like, I'm sending Ross primarily like Leslie Firing has four amazing horses. So I send pictures of Leslie's horses. I send pictures of, of Leslie Phipps horses. We've been, we've been, it's, you, you should send him some of your horses. That way we get to know them. You know, we don't work abstractly. Yeah, I, I don't know horses, uh, the, the, the difference in horse as well. Uh, and that's something I'm learning now. Uh, I, I struggle with wanting to replicate a specific horse with trying to just capture the feeling of a, of a, of a horse in rest or in motion. Um, but I don't, as far as thoroughbreds, draft, English, um, all these different, I, I know when I send Jane an image, she'll say, oh, that's a warm blood. And I, Okay, uh, so I, that's there. I know a lot of different little subtleties uh, and some major uh, differences as well that I'm that I'm not familiar with. That I I'm, I struggle with if I if I want to know those differences or if I want to just try to uh, just encapsulate uh, just the idea of a horse or or, or that kind of a, uh, you know there. I, I think some of the early ones that I worked on look more like donkeys. And I knew they didn't look like horses, but I had to kind of figure out well, what makes a donkey a donkey and what makes a horse a horse, what makes a quarter horse that, what makes, and, and a lot of it sometimes comes down to subtle little features. Uh, and that's where I, in, in the process of glass, uh, you have to make a lot of decisions fairly quickly. And sometimes if you commit to a decision, you can't necessarily go back or fix it. Uh, and that is a, a lot of what I struggled with in the beginning with Jane, where I had to make these decisions that I'd never made before, and I would just make them, and a lot of times they were wrong, uh, but we would learn from that and move along. And so the horses, I, I've only been making horses for maybe about three years, 
uh, and the first year, uh, they were almost cartoony. Uh, I wasn't sure about proportion, posture. Uh, what's that? Because uh, Russ, they weren't cartoony. They were. They you. you they were cartoony. What they were, what you do is, I, you're as a student, you know, like when I think of us as all students of something, you have to go through each and every step. You are, you have this beautiful practice of needing to learn the slow way. And if I try to tell you, oh, it's like this. You just give uh -oh. yourself, and then you give the, and that's what makes you write this. <laughs> Jane, there I, are, uh, I think we lost everybody. Yeah. Well, folks, I think um, I don't want to end this abruptly, but I also want to be conscious of folks' time, and we're at about 1240 here. Um, so, uh, and maybe we have Jane back. It looks like you're back. Um, did did I, Ross hear what I said? Because he did you hear what I said about the way you learned? A, a little bit. Oh, okay. We I'll can we can talk. We'll, we we can talk more. Not on. And this I just want to say no, I think no, your no. horses are phenomenal and beautiful. It was just a question of um, like movement within them. Oh well, that's what I will be. Uh, uh, I will be working on yes, yes, and and I and I do. Does she uh, have horse? Does she have horse? I think she's she trying horse? to. Uh, are you on a horse? Do you? Do yeah, I, I I raise I raise cow I raise cutting horses, cow horses, and uh, rodeo horses. Okay. Well, we should put you two in touch, yeah. and right, we can I do write that. Some of these. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you want my email, I can put it in the chat box. Sure, that'd be great, Jackie. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, because that'll that's uh, I, I'm always looking. I, I I don't like to stay too long with one idea. Uh, I'm working on this sort of posture right now, but I want to move on to other ones. So I'm always trying to mix it up. Uh, I, I I don't want to say I get bored easy, but I'm I'm I have a slight ADD, uh, so I'm always <laughs> trying something new. So I, I it would definitely the more research I do on those, the more the work will start to head that way. So yeah, I'm, I am very interested. That'd be great, thank you. Okay, folks, I think we're gonna sign off here and um, I wanna say a huge thank you all for joining us and Jane and Ross, that was a really incredibly inspiring conversation. I really, I know I learned a lot and enjoyed it very much and I assume everyone else did too. So thank you for taking time out of your days and sharing your thoughts on how you work together and your art and. It was really informative and inspiring. Hey, Paul and Leela, I'm looking forward to seeing you in Seattle again. Uh, yeah, we'd like to visit too as soon as we get vaccinated. Thank it's you. Great to see you all. Great yes. to see you. Thank you. And we'll share Thank a link you. to a recorded version of this in a couple of days. Great. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Bye bye. Thanks, bye, Thanks bye. for doing this, Jane. Bye. <laughs> bye. bye. Bye, 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 Bye. Uh, oh yeah, they're sleeping. They think this is boring. <laughs> Can't wait All to right. come visit you guys. Bye. 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 Signing off.